The Michigan State Spartans kick off their 2023 college football season exactly two weeks from today, on Friday, September 1st, where Mel Tucker and his squad will take the field to match up against the Central Michigan Chippewas. The following week in Week 2, Michigan State will host the FCS Richmond Spiders, and then Michigan State, out of the gate, will get what I think will be a top four test coming to East Lansing in the Washington Huskies, who I think, along with conference foes Michigan and Ohio State, are bound and determined to reach the college football playoffs in the college football playoffs final season as a four-team playoff. Penn State is another team on Michigan State's schedule who I think is in the top 10, and Penn State certainly has the potential, as well as the other three schools in Washington, Michigan, and Ohio State, to win it all this season. Add on top of that, that Maryland, Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, and even Rutgers all have the potential to improve after their respective seasons in 2022, I think Michigan State has the number one strength of schedule in the country for the 2023 season. They will have to carry for the entire season, most notably after the first two games of the year, which Central Michigan and Richmond, those are going to be cupcake games where State should, in my opinion, win by three or four or five touchdowns or even more, hopefully, especially if you're a Michigan State fan. And Mel Tucker, Jay Johnson, and Scotty Hazelton will test the depth chart. They'll play multiple guys and experiment in those first two games. But after those two games, the remaining 10 game slate, Michigan State will have to carry the yoke of the nation's toughest schedule. And I open up this video to say those things because Michigan State does not have much room for error. They don't. Michigan State last year went 5-7, and seven, and it was a very low-quality 5-7, and seven, as Mike Valeni would put it. It was not like 2021 Nebraska, where all seven losses were close, competitive, and the team just had problems finishing in the fourth quarter. Michigan State had tons of problems finishing in the fourth quarter, but those were just in a handful of games where Michigan State was somehow in as it already was against Michigan, against Ohio State, and against Penn State. The Spartans did put up some fight at moments in those games, but ultimately Penn State, Michigan, and especially Ohio State yet again blew out Michigan State on the field. Minnesota humiliated the Spartans in East Lansing, and Washington made Michigan State look totally unprepared on the road in a game which was also in Week 3 just like this year's Michigan State-Washington matchup will be. Also, what did not help the Spartans' case was ultimately a loss to Indiana as well. Indiana last year was a very bad football team. They went 4-8, and eight, and Michigan State led big time at the half. And a loss to Maryland as well hurt, but Maryland last year was 8-5. and five. And earlier in the season, looked like a top 25 team in my opinion. That was last season, and this year I think the schedule gets only tougher than it was last year. Mel Tucker, there is also pressure on him because Michigan State wildly underperformed last year, according to preseason expectations. I think Mel Tucker and his staff went from being one of the more overrated parts of college football to one of the more underrated teams and products and staffs and rosters of college football. I mean, the pendulum truly swung with the national perception of Michigan State. And I think what the Big Ten Network said on their bus tour about Michigan State's fall camp, what I heard from Mel Tucker, what I've heard from Chris Kapilovich from their interviews, I think Michigan State's having a great fall camp. I think this team is going to bounce back in a bigger way than their record might indicate in 2023, and if they can return enough pieces for 2024, and if they can use the transfer portal right, and if they can finish out strong in their recruiting class, maybe by landing David Stone, although that's doubtful, but there are some other four stars that Michigan State's targeting, like a big-time running back prospect out of Washington, if they can get the ball rolling in recruiting, hit the 
hammer on the nail in the transfer portal and they can win seven, eight, nine games, maybe six games is acceptable if the Spartans are very competitive in all their losses and maybe have a big upset or their six wins are all blowouts. I think Michigan State in 2024 could be a top 20, potentially top 15 team product where Penn State as well, along with the Spartans, could rise as Michigan and Ohio State, due to the sheer amount of talent leaving for the draft, will likely take a step back. But that's 2024. I'm just setting the stage because Michigan State is more so being talked about as a program rather than as a team, from my view. And that's because, from my understanding, a lot of people still believe that Michigan State is in rebuilding mode. Many people look at this daunting schedule and think that well, Michigan State can't do much of anything with this schedule, and I think that's a wrong way to think, especially when the Big Ten, the Big Ten is one in the trenches, especially on the interior, but just plainly in the trenches. When you look at the coaches and media all-conference awards for offensive linemen, Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Northwestern appear here and there along with Michigan State. Penn State is one of the few teams who's at the top of the Big Ten who rarely appears with all-conference mention or all-conference awarded offensive linemen or defensive tackles, though they do very well at defensive end. The conference is dominated in the trenches. It's rare. This is not the ACC. This is not even the Pac-12 or the Big 12 or the SEC. The Big Ten is unique to a certain degree in that regard, though the SEC would be the closest to the Big Ten when it comes to trench play truly mattering. But that's because the best teams in the sport have the best trench play, as Georgia has shown for the past two seasons, and also Michigan, who has not had the success Georgia has had, but has ruled the Big Ten for the past two seasons. They've had the best offensive line in the Big Ten for two years in a row, and that's a big reason why. Well, I'm here to tell you that Michigan State has a top-half offensive line in the Big Ten, and this is after a season last year where the offensive line could not stay healthy to save their lives, a season where the offense regressed severely from the 2021 season where with Kenneth Walker, a healthy Jaden Reed, Trey Mosley, as well as Speedy Naylor, Speedy Naylor and Jaden Reed had, I think, around 17 to 18 yards per reception. A lot of that was based off of play action, but the offense that Jay Johnson ran that really centered around Kenneth Walker was a big success in 2021, scoring 31.8 points per game, which was a top 40 scoring offense nationally. The team went 11-2, but last year they scored a touchdown less per game, only scoring 24.4 points per game, which was nearly outside of the top 100 in scoring offense. Many use total offense, as in how many yards per game you have, but if you have gobs of yards per game but don't have the points to show for it, that's pretty pathetic, and it's also very inefficient. So I like to go by scoring offense, scoring defense, although I think defensive touchdowns and other kinds of touchdowns are factored into those things, which is unfortunate, so it's important to have multiple perspectives and statistics. But anyway, enough of my rambling there. Michigan State regressed from 21 to 22. We all know this. And in 23, I think they're going to take a big step forward. And if you look at the offensive line and how Michigan State is rated there, I think that they're in the top half of the Big Ten, and they return several starters like Nick Semek, who's reportedly injured, but will hopefully start against Central Michigan, and the staff says it's a minor injury. J.D. Duplain has been getting some time at center in the meanwhile. Brandon Baldwin, Spencer Brown, Michigan State returns three or four players who had critical downs and good amounts of playing time in the 2022 season. Gino Van de Mark will be the newest member of this offensive line as a redshirt sophomore. All of these players were rated, I think, in the top 100 or top 200 for their respective offensive line positions, according to Pro Football Focus. I know Nick Samak was around the 50th spot, definitely in the top 100, rated as one of the higher-rated centers 
in the Big Ten. And Chris Kapilovich talked about how the offensive line's been gaining weight. He says that the position is much healthier, much deeper than it was in the 2020 and 2022 seasons, which is a good news. But I wanted to open up the video talking about that because to set the stage, Michigan State is going to have tests early, middle, and later in the college football season. Fall camp is very critical because Michigan, they have four home games against opponents where they will be so favored and where they will outmatch their opponent in such a big way that they have four games to really mess around and make mistakes or to compensate for maybe a severe injury that happens against Eastern Carolina. Though, of course, we hope that no one gets injured. Michigan State does not have that same cushion that Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, and the majority of the Big Ten teams do. So getting it right in fall camp and getting it right in those first two games is even more important. Michigan State has a shorter timetable, and they're going to have to work harder and more efficiently than many of the other teams in their conference just to go to a bowl game or to go to a decent bowl game against a somewhat quality opponent like maybe another SEC school or another Power 5 school that matters. So the offensive line, I think, is a huge part in that, and we'll get to that again later in the video when I touch on some news on the offensive side of the football. But I want to talk about the defense and get the unit out of the way that has hampered Michigan State the most in the Mel Tucker era. There is some good news for the defensive line in particular, and that is that the defensive line is gaining a good amount of weight. A number of reserves at defensive end saw significant weight changes, including freshmen. Jalen Thompson and Andrew DePape gained 25 and 20 pounds respectively. Ken Talley bumped up 15 pounds on his 6'3 frame. James Scott gained 10. And other starters and edge players either remained steady or gained weight as well. Jalen Sammy, who's expected to have some playing time, if not start outright at defensive tackle, remained a team-high 330 pounds but gained an inch at 6'7". Michigan State, they need depth at defensive line. That was an area that hurt them a lot last year. Last year, when Jacob Slade went down, along with players like Xavier Henderson at secondary, but just having Slade and Henderson go down, Two leaders, but also two players nonetheless, Michigan State's lack of depth was painfully obvious, especially when Michigan State's defense, which was one of the best at stopping the run in 2021, was awful at stopping the run for most of 2022. Despite returning most of the key contributors that helped that front seven be legendary at shutting down Michigan's run game, at doing okay against Ohio State's run game, despite Ohio State have wide open passing lanes against that awful 2021 secondary, Michigan State could halt the run from any opponent in 2021. They returned most of those starting contributors in 22, and because of a few injuries here and there, the efficiency just plummeted through the center of the earth. So it's good that whether it's Dre Butler or Jarrett Jackson or Jalen Sammy, incoming transfers at defensive tackle to help Derek Harmon, Maverick Hansen, and Simeon Barrow Jr., that will be good. Alex Van Sumeren, he was redshirted last year despite the fact that he was playing on the field. They did not want to burn his redshirt, and I think that was a moment where the staff sacrificed short-term success for long-term success, and I think this defensive tackle room is definitely top 10 in the nation, just from a depth standpoint, from a starting standpoint. You look at Simeon Barrow Jr., that's a defensive tackle who I think is all-American potential right there, and I'm sticking by that. On defensive end, Tunmise Adelaide, he's transferring in from Texas A&M, where he had limited playing time, but was a highly ranked four-star coming out of high school. Chris Bogle was another one of those blue-chip players, but he transferred in from Florida in the 2022 preseason. He was unfortunately injured for much of the year. Brandon Wright, Avery Dunn, Ken Talley, Zion Young, James Scott, some of these players we've already mentioned. These are other backups at defensive end. By Joby, 
He's a very high ceiling freshman who's athletic. He's been talked about a ton in camp. There are articles that say that they wouldn't be surprised if he became a starter and wasn't even eligible to receive a red shirt in 2023. And I agree with them. He's extremely athletic. I think they're going to put him in specialized positions on third and long as a pass rusher. He doesn't have size to him, but he was nearly a top 50 player in the 2023 recruiting class. And 6'4", 230, coming out of high school, that's not a big player whatsoever, but very fast. And Oklahoma's best player in the 2023 cycle. So fast, athletic, he knows how to use momentum despite lacking mass, and he's very skilled. So I expect him to be on the field. The defensive line for Michigan State is going to be the strength of this team, much like it was in 2021. At linebacker, it appears like Jordan Hall will likely see playing time along with starters or rotational players, Windman, Halliday, and Brule. Jacoby Windman last season led the nation, not just the Big Ten, but he led the nation in forced fumbles. And he had 49 total tackles, 18 solo tackles, five and a half sacks, six forced fumbles, and even a pick, a critical interception against Wisconsin after Wisconsin stuffed Michigan State on a fourth and goal, which likely kept Michigan State in the game and allowed the Spartans to win on homecoming. Very key player. He is on my first team all Big Ten at linebacker. I've posted my second, third, and honorable mention teams for the Big Ten in my community section. Jacoby Winman is on my first team, along with, spoiler alert, Tommy Eichenberg, Abdul Carter, and Junior Colson. Jacoby Winman, I think, is going to be a player that will play at close to an All-American level or All-American level this season. He's Michigan State's best overall player, I would say. That doesn't mean there aren't other players who could perform better than him, but just from what I've seen last year and how I think he'll perform with a whole preseason of work, another preseason at work, at Michigan State, still adjusting to the Big Ten and how it's different from the Mountain West, I think he's going to succeed with the Michigan State Spartans this season. Cal Halliday was interviewed by some of some Big Ten media members, and I think he's confident. He really likes the, the depth at linebacker, admires Jordan Hall, thinks that he's coming along very well and is very ahead of the program, ahead of the curve for a true freshman. Hall and Brule look to be the second stringers behind Jacoby Winman and Cal Halliday, who are the two starting linebackers in Scotty Hazleton's 4-2-5, but Hazleton has been known to occasionally use three linebackers, so I guarantee you along with Joby, Jordan Hall, you won't be able to keep him off the field and he won't be able to achieve a red shirt either. And then at secondary, I'm not going to talk about the secondary too much. There's so much to prove. This unit is so unpredictable that I'm not going to, I'm not really going to predict what's going to happen here outside of the fact that I think the ceiling for the defensive back room is mediocrity at best, at least for this year. I know Michigan State hired Jim Solgato. Harlan Barnett before has churned out elite secondaries with the no-fly zone, but this unit has been awful for three years in a row. So now you have to prove to me that this secondary can be good. And there are players to do that. Dylan Tatum and Jaden Mangum at safety. Terry Roberts, some some are Melvin, Charles Brantley. I think those are decent cornerbacks. And also can't forget about, you just can't forget about Angelo Gross, Justin White, Chester Kimbrough. I seriously doubt he'll start a corner this season. According to rlads.com, he will. But that was from an article that was... 16 days old. So I imagine that Terry Roberts, who is projected to be his backup, has taken his spot. Terry Roberts played some significant playing time as a backup for Iowa at corner. So I would love to pick up a corner from Iowa if Michigan ever needed that, and I think he's going to be a good fit for Michigan State's defense. On the offensive side of the football, Mel Tucker has a critical decision to make. I think that Caton Hauser is long-term the future of the program at quarterback. I mean, you look 
and this was before I read an article that confirmed my suspicions, you look at Katen Hauser standing or sitting next to Noah Kim, you look at them, and Hauser's bigger, he's more athletic, the staff has also talked about his upside, with offensive coordinator Jay Johnson list- listing him as an athletic freak, especially in regards to arm talent. And when I heard the Big Ten media interviewing Noah Kim, Kaden Hauser side by side, I couldn't tell much of a difference in their responses. I mean, they both seem like they're capable of being leaders. And that's no disrespect to Noah Kim. I think Noah Kim certainly being lighter and being praised as fast probably still has an athleticism advantage, at least right now. But looking at these two players, it sort of reminds me of Georgia's quarterback controversy. And Mel Tucker, of course, being from Georgia, I think this is a moment that has a little bit of humor to it. Who do you choose if you're Kirby Smart? You got JT Daniels, you have Brock Vandegriff, Gunnar Stockton. These are in different years, of course, who are bigger, more athletic, have more arm strength. Or do you choose Stetson Bennett, who's faster, but also smaller, doesn't have that same ceiling as a passer, but also has more experience and probably is a better leader, even if it isn't obvious. Who do you choose? And Mel Tucker has that decision to make. Do you go with the guy who has a cannon for an arm, who your offensive coordinators come out and publicly praised as a freak athlete? Or do you go with Noah Kim, who probably gives you more mobility and definitely has more experience with the program? It's going to be interesting to see. It sounds like Jay Johnson is interested in potentially going with a two-quarterback system in the first few games. I'd say by that Washington game, you need, you absolutely need to have a starting quarterback, unless maybe Hauser's the starter, but because Kim is faster, you design certain run plays for him. But I think that it would be best for Michigan State to figure out their starting quarterback sooner rather than later. Because Washington's going to come into town in week three, and Washington, they have NFL defensive ends, They have a cornerback named Jabbar Muhammad, who was excellent at Oklahoma State. Their defense last year was not good. In fact, it was one of Peyton Thorne's better games was against that Washington defense. But they've shored up their secondary. Kalen DeBoer said at media days that he's confident his secondary is better. And both of Washington's defensive ends will get drafted in 2024. In fact, one of their defensive ends, I think, is going to be an All-American, and he had 10 sacks last season. So Michigan State, they need to have their quarterback situation figured out, and preferably sooner rather than later. But I think the Spartans have two good options. Whether you go with Kim or Hauser, yes, one might be better than the other, and it sounds like Kim, it would be better for Michigan State at least this year and in the short term to have him start. But Michigan State has a deep quarterback room. It's not like you have one good starter, and if he goes down or if he performs poorly, you have no other options. Michigan State has two good quarterbacks who, in my opinion, Hauser probably has great or near elite potential in the long term, and Noah Kim has great potential. So I think that's good news from a quarterback room standpoint. Despite Jalen Berger initially starting, I think Nathan Carter is going to take over. I think Carter will have around 1,000 rushing yards this season. He'll have a breakout year and end up replacing Berger as running back number one. Carter has been praised throughout the preseason, and from the minute he transferred to Michigan State, and when I watched some of his highlights, looked at his build, looked at his statistics, I was confident from day one that he was going to be a better running back than Jalen Berger. I expect that to become a reality. Maybe not at the beginning of the year. The staff obviously, as shown last year, prefers Berger in more of his power run game over more of an athlete like they had in Broussard last year. But I think Nathan Carter is too good and too great to be ignored or to be placed in a rotation that favors Berger over him. Finally, on the offensive line, we've talked about them a fair amount, so I'm not going to talk about them much more. Nick Samak currently has a minor injury. However, Chris Kapilovich is confident in the offensive line's depth and rotation. 
when talking about his injury, it didn't sound like, you know, they want him to get back on the field, but it sounded like a minor injury. Semak is confident that he'll get back on the field. And in the meantime, the staff and the offensive line are continuing to work. They're finding out, you know, obviously when you have a minor injury like this, it teaches you, well, how do you deal with adversity? And what formation or what package or what rotations do we make to compensate for an injury like that? And I think that that helps teach the offensive line how to suffer through adversity, or not necessarily suffer, but learn from it. Hopefully Nick Samak's back by the Central Michigan game because I don't like to see players injured no matter what team they're from or even no matter what kind of player they are, whether position or whether they're on my team or not, or whether I view them in the same way I do C.J. Stroud where I really like him as a player or if there's a that's a player that I haven't heard much of. I want every team to be as healthy as possible because all of these players... They're fighting for a starting job. They're fighting for possibly a position in the NFL, which could be life-changing. So hopefully Semet gets back. Good luck to him. But it sounds like he is going to be starting and starting in the Central Michigan game, which is really good. And he's a returning starter along with J.D. Duplain. Both of them are up 5 pounds to 305 on their 6-4 frames. All... All of the offensive linemen are above 300 pounds, along with several, several backups. So that's very good news. What are some position battles? We already know that quarterback's a big battle. Noah Kim leads the room in experience, but Hauser obviously has the higher upside. But what are some other battles and what are some other things that have been mentioned in fall camp or things that I think should be looked after? while fall camp continues. A room that we haven't talked about yet is tight end. Malik Carr. Malik Carr is going to be one of the best tight ends in the nation and one of the best tight ends in the Big Ten. I have him as a third teamer on my all-conference team, which might sound low, and it very well could be, but the Big Ten is stacked at tight end. You have Corey Deitches, you have Colston Loveland, you have Eric All, Luke Lachey, Brevin Spanford, Nick Callerup, Cade Stover, all of whom, especially Spanford, Lachey, All, Loveland, Stover, Deitches, Callerup's more of a blocking tight end, but most of the other tight ends could play at a first-team all-conference level, potentially at some kind of all-American level. I mean, the Big Ten is stacked at tight end. They don't have a Brock Bowers, who is by far the number one tight end in the nation, but they have very deep, great, near-elite tight ends, and Malik Carr is one of those players. Whether making one-handed catches, breaking multiple tackles, or adding a few pounds to be able to block better, I think that Malik Carr is going to be one of the better tight ends in the Big Ten and in the country. However, there are several quality players behind him. For example, Jalen Franklin, Tyneal Hopper, Evan Morris, and Adamola Filet. So all those four backups, I think, have the potential to see, I think, significant playing time for a backup tight end. And Michigan State, has a when you have a great starter and when you have above average to good backup amongst multiple players, your tight end room is in a good position. And Michigan State's going to need to utilize their tight ends more because Jaden Reed and Keon Coleman are no longer with the program. So who's going to be the second string tight end who's going to be that second guy behind Malik Carr at tight end I think is an important position battle to look after because Malik Carr is going to have in my opinion over 500 receiving yards and definitely over five receiving touchdowns this season he's too good of a target it's almost impossible to guard him he's such a mismatch for secondary players for linebackers for anyone he faces up against because he's tall long athletic and at wide receiver, Trey Mosley, Christian Fitzpatrick, Monterey Foster, Antonio Gates, and Alante Brown, who transferred in from Nebraska, all of them are good. I'd say Trey Mosley might be great, but they don't have that same ceiling that Keon Coleman or Jaden Reed did. In my opinion, none of them except maybe Mosley have 
a level of play or ceiling that even compares to Jaden Reed or Keon Coleman. This wide receiver room dropped off big time. Peyton Thorne, Michigan State might have even benefited from him transferring to Auburn, but Keon Coleman was a big loss from a talent standpoint. So how do you make that up? Well, at wide receiver, Michigan State added Elante Brown, but more importantly, I think they're going to have to get the tight ends more involved. At running back, I expect Carter to have around 1,000 rushing yards. Berger will still contend for running back number one, though. At wide receiver, the Spartans returned Trey Mosley, and they brought in Elante Brown from the portal. At defensive end, I'm curious to see how Chris Bogle, what he does returning from injury. He's currently a projected starter at defensive end. Junmise Adelaide and by Job, I think those are players who high ceiling, blue chip talent, both are athletic. Adelaide is more of a traditional defensive end, much bigger than Job is, but Job has that athleticism. I think he could be used in a similar way to how David Ajabo was used in 2021, where you line him up in specific pass rush situations on third and medium third and long, or maybe third and short when you're willing to gamble, and his athleticism and speed might allow him to just blow past a tackle and get to the quarterback. And then at corner, Michigan State, I think, actually has good depth at corner this season, but you can have a deep corner room, and you can still have mediocre or just above average play because you have a bunch of mediocre corners. So what I mean by good depth is... If you suffer an injury, your backup or your third stringer or your fourth stringer starting, the quality of play won't deteriorate at an accelerated rate. I think if Michigan State suffered one or two injuries at the corner position this season, they might be fine or okay, and maybe they'll suffer a little bit, but it won't be too bad. But I don't know if that's because they have a lot of good players at corner or if they just have a lot of below-average, mediocre players at corner. And only time, only time will be able to tell, because I just do not trust whatever is talked about regarding the secondary until I see it. I think it's still going to be a weak point of this defense and of the team. I do think it will be the best secondary of the Mel Tucker era, but that isn't saying much. But these are just some position battles to look out for. Defensive tackle... Could count as another one, but I chose to go with defensive end because I think there are a couple of new players who weren't on the team last year who will have significant playing time this season. And at tackle, Simeon Barrow is definitely going to start, and I honestly think that Derek Harmon will be a starter opposite of him. Jalen Sammy will just get rotational playing time, be an impact player, but we'll see if he is going to end up being a starter. Thank you guys for watching this video where I talked about Michigan State football talked about their fall camp as well and the current status of their roster and how I think their team will perform from a roster standpoint in 2023. Hope you guys had a good time. Make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment your thoughts on this video down below. See you guys later. Bye-bye.